come into a new country where you don't know the language. You don't have any family or friends close by. You don't fully understand the culture and you soon start to feel lonely, isolated and hopeless. Your life just freezes. That's what happened to me when I moved to this country from Mexico five years ago. I quickly started to feel very anxious and depressed. And I know I'm not the only one. A recent study by Blue Cross Blue Shield indicates that there has been a 31% increase in the prevalence of major depression among millennials between the years 2014 and 2017. But it is very likely that this number has increased due to the current pandemic. Let's Talk Philly Conversation Circles has been working to reduce this trend by providing a free and safe space for immigrant millennials to feel connected to their peers through virtual conversations that are guided by trend facilitators. This is the only non-clinical peer-to-peer skill building wellness initiative with a shared decision-making model in Greater Philadelphia. What's a virtual meeting without a little tech challenge? This is the time we live in, this is the way we operate, but nonetheless, what a great video and what a wonderful way for us to begin. The video you just saw featuring Karen Cervera was presented last night as part of a pitch competition hosted by the Economy League and Independence Blue Cross. Karen and her colleague Yushan Chow are graduates of the Welcoming Center's Immigrant Leadership Institute and are great examples of how your support of the Welcoming Center has an exponential impact in our community, which is why we are here tonight. Muy buenas noches y bienvenidos. Good evening and welcome all. Thank you for joining us for the SOLAS 2021 virtual celebration. I am Uva Coles, founder and CEO of Inclusiva, a diversity, equity, and inclusion firm that helps leaders build inclusive competency, workforce solutions, and a culture of belonging. But tonight, I join you wearing my most important hat, a more personal one. In addition to being a proud board member of the Welcoming Center, I am also a proud immigrant Born and raised in La Republica de Panama, the Republic of Panama, my family and I came to the Philadelphia region over three decades ago in search of more, more safety, more stability, more opportunity at economic mobility. It is precisely this background that attracted me to the Welcoming Center, to its mission, its people, and its programs. And tonight, it is an honor to serve as your host and to help you experience the great work of the Welcoming Center. So let me begin by expressing our gratitude. We are so thankful that you're able to join us tonight. We know many of you have struggled with the impacts of a triple pandemic, an economic downturn, high turn, heightened racial injustice, and COVID. Supporting our participants through this moment has been critically important recognizing that health and wellness have been an area of great need and support. In fact, health and wellness is one of the key areas we have been working on with our participants. We also know many of you, many of us, are grappling with what it means to be socially distant while still working, still taking care of our families and ourselves, while juggling a lot of competing priorities and still trying to find time for necessary connection. So your presence tonight is a gift. And we wanna fill this room, virtual as it may be, with your voice, your energy, and your warmth. To that end, let's use our, use our chat function throughout the evening to communicate with each other. And with that said, let me just ask a question to get us started. How are you doing tonight? Feel free to add your feelings to the chat. Give me a word, give me a sentence, give me an emoji. Tell me whatever's on your mind. Whatever you do, just, just talk to me, talk to each other. And while you share your thoughts in chat, I want to acknowledge what we know well and what is also so challenging about this time. Community, connection, and inclusion are critical to our health and wellness. And we do, we do so as much as we can, we do as much as we can to build inclusive spaces for that kind of necessary connection. Tonight is no different. 
We will have a networking session following the main program for a chance to connect with each other, to connect with our board members, our staff, and most importantly, our participants. We know that through the networking session, we will better connect and we will get a little bit closer to the welcoming center experience. Now, let me manage expectations. Keep in mind that this is the Solas Award. This is not the Golden Globes. You got me, Uva, not Tina, not Amy, right? But we will still do our best to celebrate virtually. Inevitably, we saw it happen a little while ago. There will be some hiccups along the way, including my dog Coco, maybe my kids and my husband Samori. They all seem to love showing up on Zoom. So forgive us in advance. Expect the unexpected. And thank you for showing us grace and sharing your love. So let's get to the reason we are here. Tonight, we celebrate 18 years of the Welcoming Center and our honoree, Jose Ramon Fernandez Peña, MD, MPA. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers this evening and a fireside chat focused on immigrant integration. Of equal importance, I'm happy to announce that there's a matching donation offered tonight from our friends, Hao Li and Evan Lowe. We know this year has been especially challenging and that the pandemic has caused a lot of financial disruption. Still, we rely on the money we raise through our Solas Awards to help us fund our efforts to support our immigrant communities. If you would like to make a contribution tonight, please use text to give or make a pledge. You will see reminders on screen throughout the program and we will also share instructions in the chat. And now, damas y caballeros, amigos, friends, I would like to welcome Daniel K. Fitzpatrick, President of Citizens Mid-Atlantic Region, for our sponsor remarks. Hi, I'm Dan Fitzpatrick, President of Citizens here in the Mid-Atlantic Region. We have been a proud partner of the Welcoming Center since its founding 18 years ago to this exact date. On behalf of my colleagues, we congratulate the Welcoming Center for always elevating immigrants and their contributions to our economy. And special congratulations to this year's honoree, Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez Pena. Dr. Fernandez Pena is a passionate advocate for equitable policies in healthcare and workforce development. Now more than ever, his work to ensure diversity and representation in the healthcare sector is extremely important. So thank you, Dr. Fernandez Pena. At Citizens Bank, workforce development is a core tenant of what we do in our community, ensuring that everyone in Philadelphia has the education, the job skills to pursue entrepreneurship and great careers and family sustaining jobs is of critical importance to all of us in Philadelphia. While Citizens supports workforce development programs across our geography, we feel especially fortunate in Philadelphia to have so many excellent partners like the Welcoming Center who work tirelessly to train and employ our neighbors with quality careers. So thank you to my good friend, Peter Gonzalez and the wonderful staff at the Welcoming Center for the terrific work you do on behalf of all of us in Philadelphia. Citizens continues to be proud to support your mission. So please everyone have a wonderful evening and thanks for all you do. For the past 18 years, the Welcoming Center has been connecting immigrants of all skill and education levels to meaningful employment opportunities. Our dedicated team of staff and volunteers have been providing training and coaching, connecting employers with immigrant talent. This year during the pandemic, all of our programming and support went online. We went virtual. It didn't stop us. Instead, we adapted. One thing that has been consistent is that we do this work in collaboration with many people, partners and employers. We support one another and we learn from each other. And together we will drive equitable growth by building a more diverse and inclusive workforce. Hi. I'm Peter Gonzalez, the president and CEO of the Welcoming Center. I'd like to start by thanking all of my colleagues. You are the heart and soul of the organization. This has been an extraordinary year. 
Many of you are juggling multiple responsibilities of homeschooling and caring for family members with an unusually heavy load of virtual meetings, fundraising, and program delivery. Despite these challenges, you always put our mission and our participants first. We're here tonight to raise the money needed to support your incredible work. To all of our participants, past, present, and future, whether you're joining us from Philadelphia or from another continent in a time zone far away, thank you for sharing your stories and your lives with us. You are the inspiration and shining examples of how welcoming works. It truly takes all of us to make this happen. From the employers and corporate sponsors to the individual donors, volunteers, and our board members. We are here because of you. I'd like to thank Dan Fitzpatrick and the whole team at Citizens Bank for joining us this evening and being one of our strongest supporters from the very beginning. Thank you to the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation for sharing our values and investing in our future. Rudy and Shrin Carson, I'd like to thank you for your confidence and your friendship over these past seven years, for being shining examples and advocates of our mission. And a special thanks to Hal Lee and Evan Lowe for your trust and vision of shared leadership. We are deeply grateful and highly motivated by your match challenge of $75,000 this year, in addition to your champion sponsorship. I'd also like to thank all of you who've made a personally meaningful contribution to support our work. Every dollar counts. And remember, tonight, it's our only major fundraiser of the year. And of all the years, we need your support now. There are many ways to donate. You can send an email to Rebecca at welcomingcenter.org. You can text to give, or you can visit our website. Please help us take advantage of Howley and Evans match challenge tonight. Thank you to all of our friends at Independence Blue Cross too. For more than 80 years, Independence Blue Cross has been a beacon in our region, focused on their mission to enhance the health and well being of the people and communities they serve. Never has that been more evident than during the last 12 months of the pandemic, when we saw them address health disparities through education and assistance by launching the Beat COVID-19 public health campaign, supporting the PHL COVID-19 fund and the work of the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium. Thank you. And finally, congratulations to our honoree, Jose Ramon. You've been a trailblazer in our field, a mentor to so many, and a dear and trusted friend to me over these many years. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker and a hero of mine, Stephanie Sun. Thanks, Peter, and hello, everyone. When I first moved to the United States five years ago, I never would have imagined that I would be speaking to all of you like this. One of the first things I did when I arrived in Philadelphia was trying to improve my English and find a job. That's when I found the Welcoming Center. Over the past five years, I have been a volunteer, a program participant, and the proud graduate of the Immigrant Leadership Institute. For a while, I was even an employee helping support immigrant entrepreneurs. And now I sit on the board of directors at the Welcoming Center. This past year, I was appointed to serve as the executive director of the Pennsylvania Governor's Advisory Commission on Asian Pacific and American Affairs. It means so much to me. And I know it's very meaningful and encouraging to other immigrants. It shows to the world that Pennsylvania is a welcoming state with opportunities for everyone, recognizing and supporting immigrants' values and voices. Over the past few years, I have met so many people who have come from all over the world to live in Pennsylvania. And they're working so hard day and night to pursue their dreams. Everybody wants to be accepted and respected and to be able to support themselves and their families in this new land. I feel so lucky to have found the Welcoming Center when I did. And now I'm in a position to give back and help others. Please know that 
even the smallest support for immigrants at the World Coming Center could change the trajectory of a person's life and have a profound impact on their family and the generations that follow. Thank you for allowing me to share my experience and perspective with you. It's now my honor to introduce my current boss, Governor Tom Wolf. Hi, I'm Governor Tom Wolf. I'd like to congratulate the Welcoming Center on your 18th anniversary and welcome everyone to the SOLAS Awards. I have long supported the mission of the Welcoming Center. Your work serving and supporting the immigrant community helps make our Commonwealth a better place to live and work. The SOLAS Awards have always been about coming together and shining a light on the contributions immigrants make in our communities. Congratulations to Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez Pena on being honored with this year's SOLAS Awards. Thank you for all you do for the Commonwealth. And thanks also to the Welcoming Center for your innovation and your hard work. And most of all, thank you for your commitment to serving immigrants in Pennsylvania. Governor Wolf, thank you for joining us. Now I'd like to introduce Giselle Loretto Fetterman, the second lady of Pennsylvania. Giselle is the founder of Free Store 15104, where surplus and donated goods are received and redistributed to neighbors in need. The Free Store's goal is both needed and timely. They are laser focused on eradicating food and clothing insecurity, and they have inspired spin-off locations and the birth of 412 Food Rescue. Giselle was born in Brazil and immigrated as a child to the US living as an undocumented immigrant for over a decade. But I will leave it to her to tell her story as only she can. Giselle, welcome. Hi, my name is Giselle Bajeto Fetterman. I am Pennsylvania's second lady and I am so honored to be here with you today. As I open most speeches, I say, if you are new to Pennsylvania, if you are not born here, um, thank you for choosing Pennsylvania. It's something that I would have wanted to hear in spaces that I was in. Um, so I try to open with that. Also, I'd like to say that wherever you came from and however you got here, we're so glad to see you. That was one of the most powerful sentences I've ever heard in my life. I came to this country as a young immigrant my mother, who in Brazil had a PhD and a career um, running hospitals, um, decided that she wanted us to be somewhere safer. So as a single mom with all the courage in the world, she came home with a suitcase for my brother and I and said, please pack your favorite things. We are off to an adventure. <clears throat> and I remember being seven and being so worried that I was gonna choose the wrong things because at seven, everything feels really important. But I chose a journal and a doll and some things, some clothes, and we arrived. And when we arrived in this country, unfortunately, the welcoming center was not there. <laughs> we needed a place like the welcoming center. We needed a soft space to land, which is what the welcoming center is for so many people but we didn't have that soft place, unfortunately. And now we find ourselves in this new country. Um, we don't speak the language. We don't know anyone here. And on top of that, our family was undocumented. So this began a 15 year journey of living in the shadows of looking for, for hope somewhere. <clears throat> and when I uh, walked into my first classroom, the principal brought me in. And of course I didn't speak English then. And he walked me into the classroom and he said, this is Giselle, she comes from Brazil. And my teacher, my first teacher, looked at me and said, wherever you came from and however you got here, I'm so glad to see you. And it was translated to me by a classmate, but it's been a message that has carried me uh, through difficult times. It's influenced how I meet new people, how I welcome people into spaces, 
And it's even a sign that you find when you walk into one of my nonprofits. It says there for you, for anyone who comes to feel welcomed because um, welcoming someone into a space is one way to show love to each other. It's one way to accept each other. It's one way to create a soft landing space. And in this journey, you know, I've met so many wonderful people who, who were there to help us. Um, we had uh, some experiences that weren't great as well, but um, you know, we focused on, on, on the good and what we can do because we now were in this country that we loved and we wanted to, to have a future here. When I would get ready to go to school in the morning, my mom would give my brother and I a hug and a kiss and she would say, I love you, have a great day, be invisible. And that's because our family's life could have changed at any time. Um, for a long time, you know, knocks at the door that were unexpected um, were very scary for me because that was a moment that our family could have been deported and our life would have changed. And I would remember looking at my brother and we would take a deep breath and we would say, this is it, like it's over. And uh, we lived with that fear for a very long time. And I'm grateful that we are in that place anymore. But during that time, you know, I searched for someone who, who had been there, who had that story, who maybe had been undocumented, had been afraid, um, but found a way out. And I never found that person. It was a story that just wasn't told at that time. So I made the commitment that if I ever made it out, if I found the hope um, that I would be that story, that I would share that story. And it's um, made me a target at times because I've been so public, um, but it's worth it. It's so worth it um, because I think of any young person or any person in the situation who can see and say, she found a way out. You know, there's hope for me. There are places like the Welcoming Center where we can go to for support, for guidance, for, um, you know, in entrepreneurial support, to help learn a new language, all these things, all these ways where we show someone that we love them. And carrying these experiences, um, I collected them in my mind. I knew at that time I couldn't do anything with this information, but I knew that maybe one day I could. So I hoped for that day and I collected these stories um, within me. And there's a great quote that says, if we don't transform our pain, we will transmit it. And I made the commitment to transform it. So any pain that I experienced, um, any difficult situation, I thought, how can I respond to this in a great way? And, you know, those early years, we were dumpster divers. Um, I was shocked by the waste that I witnessed in my new country. I would see furniture thrown out and perfectly good food and um, it helped our family. We were able to furnish our home with what we found in the curb and it fed us. But I remember thinking we have to do better, right? There has to be a better way to do this. And at a point that I was invisible, I couldn't do anything about it. But when that changed, that's when my work began. I started the free store um, over nine years ago. And it was this idea that some of us have so much and some of us have so little and we need to talk to each other. We need to get to know people who are different than us, who come from different places. How can we bring these worlds together where we're sharing things? And the free store is a place where you can come, where donations have come in and you can get things that your family needs at no cost. You don't have to provide your taxes. You don't have to fill out any forms. I remember how that can feel very dehumanizing. And I wanted to create an experience that was really dignified. So when you get there, you see a big sign that says wherever you came from and however you got here, we're so happy to see you. But you're also met with friendly and welcoming faces and you can get things that you may need like food, formula, diapers, clothing, shoes, accessories, toys, a little of everything things that would have otherwise been discarded, but have immense value. And in the free store, 
uh, Foreign to Food Rescue was born, which is a food rescue organization that I helped start. And that was this idea that, you know, one in seven are food insecure in this, in this country, but we also waste 40% of food. It was this disconnect that I knew we could do better than that. And having experienced food insecurity, understanding what that was like, knowing that if you're hungry, you can't focus, you can't learn, you can't help others. And we wanted to work to change that. So through those efforts, uh, we've rescued over 12 million pounds of food and we continue to grow. And then we founded For Good Pittsburgh. And that was this idea that we all have so much to contribute and sometimes maybe we just need a little, a little guidance, a little focus. And we work with um, women entrepreneurs. We um, work to develop products and ideas that support a more welcoming world. One of our first initiatives we launched was Hello Hijab. And that was at the height of the Muslim travel ban where our country felt so fragmented and we were in a painful place. And, you know, I cried for a few days and then I think, how do I respond to this? How do I transform this pain so that I don't transmit it? And the Hello Hijab was a line of um, Barbie compatible hijabs where children um, saw a diverse play space where they saw their dolls with a hijab, without a hijab and, and learned that this doesn't change who my doll is. It doesn't change who a person is. It doesn't change um, who they are and, and how they play and how they show up in the world. But most importantly, um, it allowed them to see themselves. And we talk about representation and how important that is. And if we don't see ourselves in these spaces and we don't believe we belong in them. And while I'm the first immigrant, formerly undocumented second lady of Pennsylvania, I surely hope I'm not the last. And my work is to continue to ensure that there is room and there are opportunities for all those who come after us. And I think about how different my life would have been if I had the welcoming center as a place in the beginning um, of support, not only for me, but for my family. And even one of the services you guys provide with the international um, program with jobs my mom's dream is that she can practice as a nutritionist here in this country, something that she hasn't been able to do. We haven't been able to figure out how to translate her documents, how to be able to live her experience, all her contributions and all her hard work in the country that she now loves so much. So we're gonna work on that together. Um, I'm so grateful for your support of the Welcoming Center. There are so many ways to donate. Um, but also just grateful for you all who work to be that soft landing spot for someone new because we all need that. Um, so thank you so much for having me and thank you for this wonderful evening. camino que nos trajo hasta aquí no conoce las fronteras esta pasión dentro de mí es anhelo el que me empuja cada nuevo amanecer con mis temores ilusiones y los restos del ayer Good evening. My name is Anish Gupta. I'm board chair of the Welcoming Center 
I've had the privilege of serving on the board of the Welcoming Center since 2008. And I have always fundamentally believed from the start of this organization 18 years ago that the Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia and our region will grow in opportunity and prosperity for everyone if we position ourselves as more welcoming to the newest Philadelphians and the newest Pennsylvanians. So this evening is historically one of my favorite nights of the year. It is our annual fundraiser. Uh, it's an opportunity to look back on the accomplishments of the men and women that we have served throughout the year and look forward to work, the work that is to come. Now, I do want to thank our partner sponsors that have made this evening possible, John Chu and Teresa Wallace, Patrick Mahanger and Kevin Ballman, and Dr. Teji Thomas and Center City Orthodontics. Now, and I also want to remind you that we have a very generous match challenge once again of $75,000, thanks to our board member, Hal Lee, and her husband, Evan Lowe. Uh, this is a fundraiser. While many things have ceased over the course of the past year because of the pandemic, the need to serve, integrate, and provide opportunity for the newest Philadelphians and the newest Pennsylvanians has not ebbed. I would argue it's more important than ever, but we cannot continue that work. Uh, the, the, the team at the Welcoming Center led by Peter Gonzalez does exceptional work on behalf of these men and women. We cannot continue it without the resources. So we ask you tonight, please consider giving what you can. Make this work possible. Make it possible so that when the pandemic eases, the newest Philadelphians have a shot at the American dream. Now tonight is also the first of two events that will be part of Solus Month. Uh, the second event will be hosted by our friend on the board, Bill Stock, and his firm, Clasco Immigration Partners. This is an event that many in our community have been asking for, and it will be a forum on 300 years of immigration policy in America, past, present, and future, with color commentary by me. This virtual event will be held on March 24th from 2.30 to 4 p.m. You can find the RSVP link in the chat room just now. And though Bill is one of our newest board members, uh, we always like to, to activate our board members and give them something to do. And Bill Stock has taken that to heart. So we're very grateful for Bill and his firm's leadership in pulling the second installment of Solus Month together. So I hope you are enjoying this evening. Again, I cannot understate the need uh, to raise resources tonight. Please do give what you can. Uh, we have a great program ahead of us. And I'd like to turn it back to my friend and colleague, Uva Coles. There were no instructions or operating manuals for a pandemic scenario. And so, as the rest of the world, our entrepreneurship program adapted in 2020. For years, we've been providing training classes to help entrepreneurs launch new businesses. After the city shut down to prevent the spread of COVID, existing businesses struggled to survive, and so we shifted our focus from the classroom to a commercial corridor in South Philadelphia. We provided technical assistance to help overcome language and digital barriers so businesses could obtain outdoor city permits. And we collaborated with many partners and community members to support the formation of the Association of Mexican Business Owners in Philadelphia. Anuj, thank you for your message and your continued leadership. And Giselle, Thanks for your voice and your passion for helping others find their own voice, visibility, and necessary stability. Much like Giselle, at the Welcoming Center, we also believe that wherever you came from and however you got here, we are happy to see you. We are constantly inspired by stories and experiences like Giselle's. So for our 18th birthday, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge our founder, Anne O'Callaghan. Much like Giselle, she immigrated to our country, saw a need and solved it 
by founding the Welcoming Center. We wouldn't be here without her, and we are eternally grateful to her. And thank you. As you saw in our earlier highlight reels, we absolutely love to put a spotlight on the work of the Welcoming Center's programs. It is wonderful to see employment and training, entrepreneurship, and community engagement in action, especially in these ever-changing times when everyone in our community needs extra support. Next, I would like to introduce Amanda Berkson Shilcock to present this evening's Solas Award. Thank you so much, Uva, and thank you to everyone who's joining us here tonight. It is my delight to be here with the Welcoming Center with Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez Pena, who is a dear friend, a mentor, a colleague, and a personal hero of mine. I'd like to begin by actually presenting this beautiful Solace Award to uh, Jose Ramon. So Jose Ramon, let me present that to you now. We are not physically in the same place and yet we can make this happen. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. And thank you. We're going to have some time now for a conversation. And I am hoping that all of you who are watching this tonight can feel the personal connection to this work. I could tell you so much about Jose Ramon's bio and his professional history and experience. And we'll get to some of that in our conversation. But the thing that I'm most hoping that you take away from our conversation this evening is the power that one person's vision can have when other people join together in support of that vision. And that is something that's been true of the Welcoming Center. We heard that in our second lady's remarks as she was talking about the vision of the uh, organizations that she's created. And we've seen that in so many of the other comments this evening. So, Jose Ramon, I want to start off by traveling back in time for a moment to when you were a little boy in Mexico City. You told me once that in your apartment building, you served as the Shabbos Goy for many of your Jewish neighbors, doing things like pressing the elevator button for very observant people who did not use electricity on the Sabbath. I imagine you at that young age already realizing something about how people of distinct backgrounds can lend each other their skills. What have you carried with you from those experiences into your adult life? I think that what I have carried throughout my life is my family's own immigrant experience. My family left uh, Spain in the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War, first my aunt and later on my, my parents and my brother. So that, uh, that lived experience of destruction, persecution, and having to leave a place for, and look for a better life elsewhere was something that surrounded me growing up completely. Later on, when I was of age and going to school, there were many other people in my school that had either had to leave Spain or had left Central Europe because of the Holocaust or other, other reasons. But that, that exposure to communities that had been detached from the motherland or from the fatherland and that found support in each other and that found ways to gather around food or around worshiping or around cultural events or around festivals. And also the, the understanding that somebody had helped you and you were expected to help somebody else. You pay it forward. This kind of experience that I'm here because somebody helped us get here. We, it's on us to help the next ones coming around. Later on, I migrated myself, uh, my nephew uh, migrated back to Spain. So we're a family of wanderers in a way. At the earlier part of the, of the 20th century, my great grandparents on my mother's side migrated to Morocco looking for work and for food. My mother was born in Morocco and then she returned to Spain and then she ended up in Mexico. So it, it runs in my blood. It's been a really hard year for everyone. We've been physically distant from each other. We've often been socially isolated. 
When I was talking to Peter about why the Welcoming Center had chosen you this year for the Solis Award, he said to me, Jose Ramon's work is all about connection. And when he said that to me, it just struck me as so um, immediately uh, clear, right? Your work in your professional career as a physician, in serving during the public health crisis in New York, in, in different roles um, in the AIDS crisis in the 80s, in your work in developing the Welcome Back Initiative, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then your work now with the American Public Health Association, you really have been building connections. Can you talk about why you find connections so nourishing and how you've tried to create more of them? Wow. So my brother who's probably watching would tell you that I am the gossip, el chismoso de la familia, he calls me. So I'm, I'm curious by nature. I like to learn about people, about places, about stories. I, I consider myself a storyteller and I love to hear stories and to collect stories. Mm -hmm. My friends who are, probably some of them around here can tell you that, that it's something I do. I don't know why. My parents were also very social people. There were networks. There were communities. There were this. I think of the of the sales of a, of a beehive. This connectedness and the the juice, the honey flowing throughout. So I think it makes my life richer. I think I I it's something I do. I don't think about it. It just happens to me. I love how organic that is. And I particularly love that I just learned something about you that I didn't know. Um, we love some chisme at the Welcoming Center. And I will tell you in the nine years that I worked at the Welcoming Center, six of which Anne was the executive director, we got used to using the Irish word crack, C-R-A-I-C for some juicy news or gossip or storytelling. So I can see why this, this resonates so perfectly here. Um, and, and I love that, that that's a piece of, of your connection story. You touched on this a little bit, but I wanna go deeper now. Um, you've had the experience of growing up in a country, training for a profession, and then eventually migrating to the United States. A lot of your fellow Americans share that experience. We just heard from our second lady, Giselle Fetterman, about her mother's experience. But it's often simplified and glossed over when we hear about it in news stories. And you've talked about the reasons that push people to migrate from one place to another and how they're often not ha happy reasons. You referenced Isabel Wilkerson's beautiful book, The Warmth of Other Sons, which is about the great migration of African-Americans leading the Jim Crow South for a pretty uncertain welcome in the North part of the US. What do you think gets missed in the simplified story that we're told about chasing the American dream? whether that's for immigrants or for US-born people? I think that what we oftentimes miss is the fact that, in my experience, most migration stories are, are start at a point of pain or at a point of loss or at a point of fear. The, it's few and far between the person that wakes up one morning and says, I'm just going to move to another country because I have nothing better to do or because I'm curious about what it's like to live in that weather or to be exposed to that culture. So that's one piece. The other piece that is oftentimes forgotten is that in my experience, again, people who migrate, people who, who look for another, another, uh, place to hang out if you want is people looking for where can I go work? Where can I find what I need to survive that where I am is either not available, it's very hard to get, I'm persecuted because of what I do, say, think, love, whatever it is. So the, the idea that all oh, people come looking for the American dream, people look oftentimes looking for work, they're not looking for the dream, they're looking for work. And this is what we find across the board, that people like uh, the second lady of Pennsylvania, a nutritionist in her home, Brazil, comes and probably ended up doing anything but being a nutritionist because she wanted to work so she could support her kids. And that's uh, those are two pieces that I think 
don't immediately come to mind to everybody. So you've just highlighted, I think, a couple of really important pieces. Um, I want to highlight something about you, which is that a lot of people have the experience you had of coming to the U.S. as a professional, of not immediately being able to use their skills in the way that you were trained or prepared. Not a lot of them use big picture thinking and think about systems and say, I want to create a nonprofit. I want to create a vision for transforming what the journey of an internationally trained health professional looks like. Talk to us about how you came to have that realization and how you ended up launching uh, the Welcome Back Center in San Francisco for, for internationally trained health professionals. There are probably two, two important moments. One was when I was working in New York City at Bellevue Hospital in the area of quality management. And in my department, there were one, two, three, four, five other colleagues, six other colleagues that were also foreign trained physicians that were working at desk jobs because they knew the lingo, they could read a medical record and understand what was happening and they could write reports on whatever they were looking for. So we would sit around and we would then say, hey, we're all working at these low paid jobs for the knowledge that we have. What would it look like to for us to return to the health workforce in the level that we were trained in. And even at a major teaching hospital and the most cosmopolitan allegedly city on the planet, the answer was not clear to us. I mean, this is in the dark ages before the internet and things like that, but still it was not an easy answer to find. So the, what would it look like? What would it take? Move fast forward to San Francisco, where I'm working at a community-based uh, clinic uh, as a director of health education, serving a primarily Spanish-speaking Spanish Latino immigrant community, where I run a program that is state-funded, uh, a perinatal services program that requires that you have a provider, a health educator, a nutritionist, and a social worker. Clearly, all those not only need to speak Spanish, they need to understand the culture of the population they're working with. So the day the one nutritionist that it took us two years to hire gets offered as another job elsewhere that pays for twice because a community-based clinic cannot pay the money. And then somebody comes applying for the job and they have everything you want them to have except the license to practice in California. So what's wrong with this picture? We have all these community assets and this rampant community need, and there's no bridge to connect them. I mean, what a waste of resources, the so-called brain waste. So how dumb are we that we don't try to do something about connecting those two and just investing in the community, investing in health services, enriching the health sector with that cultural and linguistic diversity that is so sorely needed and that's such a determinant of health outcomes. And I'm getting a little excited, but I mean, it's really a no-brainer. So this is what it is. I mean, Anne Callahan or Callahan can tell you the exact same story I'm telling you. I probably already told you this story. So I, I think though what's so important is that you not only noticed the problem, but you then took the next steps. You got funding from several major foundations in California to launch the first Welcome Back Center in San Francisco. You've grown it now to 10 locations across the country, including right here at the Welcoming Center in Philadelphia. And I think this just emphasizes the need for the kinds of services that the Welcoming Center and others like it provide, which is people come with such extraordinary gifts, and yet they often don't have the opportunity to contribute to their best and highest abilities. And so this is the process of removing unnecessary barriers so that folks can contribute to their highest and, and best abilities. Um, I want to talk for a moment about quality and, and related things. I've told you before that you have this beautiful stubbornness about absolutely insisting <laughs> that every person has the right to be treated with high standards. You said to you that idea is sort of encapsulated in the full meaning of the word equity. Let's pause on equity for a moment. You're president of the American Public Health Association right now. You have a pretty big bully, bully pulpit to, to talk about equity. What does equity mean to you now in this moment? Wow. 
I mean, equity means many things. It means, uh, I think it first means an understanding of what the word equity means. Because I think we throw it right and left very nicely because it's a the mot du jour, if you want. But understanding that, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of sort of written in the US Constitution where it says that all men and women, doesn't say women, but I'll add it, were, are created equal. So the the simple basic notion and understanding that we are all entitled to be treated with respect we are all entitled to have access to education we're all entitled and should be able to access health services i mean those are sound very basic and almost like what are you talking about we all know that but the there's a history of racist practices that ignored that level of equity and that has led to to a staggering and to a uh, building a, a hierarchical society where people have relegated to lower rungs of the of the of the pyramid. While we keep saying that the constitution and the, this amendment and that amendment are so important, that those basic three words all are created equal, all are created equal. Four words are are just not paid attention to. Mm -hmm. So it's so much more than the, the words. I mean, there's all this beautiful leveling the playing field and ensuring that people uh, uh, are able to lift themselves by their bootstraps. I mean, I hate all those images because it completely forgets the fact that we all come from different places and that the resources that we've been afforded vary tremendously from the color of our skin to the language that we that we speak to the people we love, I mean, it's it's a, it's really an opportunity to wake up and to think and to be intentional on how we try to redress those inequities and the role that we all play in trying to redress those inequities. And it goes beyond the the first step is the acknowledgement of that of that need, and then you can move forward with what is within your 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 set of abilities or or privilege to do something about it. The awareness of our own privilege is another really important step so that we can act accordingly. What I think is so important about what you just said is how some of these things sound simple and yet they are revolutionary when you take them seriously. Right. And it is the work of the welcoming center. It is your life's work to take them seriously. Um, and I think that is just a beautiful illustration of why you received the Solus Award tonight. I want to talk briefly about an immigrant professional who many of us first became aware of just recently. Dr. Kate Kariko is a Hungarian immigrant who came to Philadelphia 30 years ago. Over many years, she built the building blocks of what we know today as the mRNA vaccine for the COVID uh, crisis. Dr. Kariko had the experience of being underestimated repeatedly by her colleagues, by her institution, the University of Pennsylvania, by the funders of her work. I imagine that you too have been underestimated a few times in your life. <laughs> what have you learned from those times when people underestimated you? So I think that, uh, I mean, the underestimating part of it comes from assumptions that we all make and we all have that are based on stereotypes that we've all learned one way or another. So I think of those as opportunities to, to educate and as opportunities to learn, because there's both parts of the equation, right? So when people see a name like my name, Jose Ramon Fernandez Peña, and there's accents and tildes and things, the first assumption is this person cannot probably speak English in some places. So when I open my mouth, oh, you speak English so well. Uh, I can only say to you too. So, or, or uh, your name is so long. I said, yeah, well, your name is so short. I mean, but is that your mother's last name? No, I, oh my God, you have so, there's a reason why we name our children the, name, the way we name them. So there's opportunities to educate and to learn from those encounters. I'm going to try. And I'm as guilty as the next one for, in those spaces of uh, making assumptions and, and making, and, I mean, we've all learned stereotypes. It's, it, what you were saying earlier, the matter is how do we unlearn those practices and those things that we've just been 
uh, being taught throughout our lives. The Dr. Carico, who you just mentioned, whose uh, groundbreaking word almost 30 years ago is the basis for the COVID vaccines today, is something that I am making a point of, of mentioning for two, for three reasons, perhaps, because she was an immigrant and because she was a woman. She was, and this is for my friend Juli Subieta, who's probably there, because women are always, of course, held to a different standard or there's, there's, it's, there's less expected of them because of their gender. So had she been a man that had come instead from Hungary, from the UK or something, we would perhaps have been more willing to listen to what he said. That is such an important point and such a good reminder for all of us. We are at time here, so I'm about to kick it back to Uba, but I just want to thank you again for two things. I want to thank you for being the person that you are in the world, because it is that beingness that resonates outward, that inspires other people, and, and that holds us all to a higher standard. But I also want to thank you for your professional work. Like the work of the Welcoming Center, it is the work of making sure that human potential is honored and not squandered and respected and not dismissed. And I can't think of any better person to be getting the Solace Award. Congratulations, my very dear friend. Thank you so very much. And thank you to the Welcoming Center, to Peter, to Anne, to all the board of directors and to all my colleagues in the Welcome Back Initiative and in so many other places that have been so supportive of this work over the past 20 years. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Uva, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for facilitating such a rich and candid conversation. And thank you, Jose Ramon, for the record, for the record, I agree with Amanda, nothing wrong with a little chisme from time to time, a little curiosity, <laughs> right? Especially when it leads to a body of work like the one Jose Ramon has built, a body of work that has been steadfast in acknowledging the role that we can all play individually and institutionally to both acknowledge and redress inequities across difference in health, wellness, and well beyond. Next. I would like to introduce our chair elect, Hao Li Lo, for a few remarks. I can't say enough about Hao Li's leadership within the board or about her support as a champion sponsor for several years. This year, Hao Li and her husband have pledged a matching contribution of $75,000 for increased contributions as well as contributions made tonight. So far, we are at 29,479. I mean, this, this just came in, guys. You know, we're really monitoring. So 20, 29,479 towards that match. We have a little bit to go, but I have faith in all of us. Speaking of which, let me take a minute to add a little more on my end, too. While I do that, let's hear from Howley. Hello, everyone. I'd like to congratulate Jose Ramon Fernandez Pena, a true advocate for immigrants whose story has inspired me and so many others. Thank you, Amanda Bergson Chilcott, Governor Wolf, and our second lady, Giselle Fetterman, for taking the time to participate in this wonderful event. I would also like to thank our sustainer sponsors, Bob and Pat Aguilera, Bill and Mary Stock and Nina Kim and Eric Langenmeyer, as well as the Philadelphia Foundation. All of you contribute so much in addition to your generous financial support. We are so fortunate to be part of this gloriously diverse and talented community and hope you feel moved to join us after tonight's celebration. Evan and I have been committed donors since we were introduced to the Welcoming Center because its work welcoming and supporting immigrants in so many ways is so crucial now more than ever, and also because as an immigrant and children of immigrants, the people stories you have heard tonight resonate so deeply and movingly for us, witnesses as we have been to the strength, heart, and stoicism of our own parents as they struggled to ensure that we and our children would flourish. 
We hope that you will help us meet our match by donating now. Like many of you, I don't like to ask for money, but I'm willing to do it for the Walking Link Center and its continued success. One last thing, please don't forget to sign up for the SOLA special presentation on immigration presented by Clasco Immigration Partners, which will be on March 24th from 2.30 to 4. The link to register is in the chat. Once again, thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Holly. We are beyond fortunate and grateful to have such a dedicated and hardworking board member. Now, guests, friends, amigos, with that match, we are at $45,521 away from making the full match. We can absolutely do this. So please dig into your pockets and try to give a little more. It truly, truly matters. And before we do so, we are going to, in a, in a few minutes, we're going to move into our networking session. But before we do that, we wanna do two things. We would love to capture tonight. So please, if you have your cameras off, we ask that you turn on your camera and strike a pose for just a few seconds. We wanna make sure that we get everyone's lovely faces on this, if you will, so we can memorialize tonight's event with you in it. You are an important part of this evening's event. So we're gonna take this wonderful group, group selfie. It will take just about 15 seconds. So please turn on your cameras. It might feel a little bit awkward, but trust me, it will all work out. So we're gonna count this down from 15 seconds. Please, please, please turn on your cameras. Let's see your lovely faces in support of the SOLAS 2021 event. And then we'll talk a little bit before closing out. Thank you. Thank you for helping us with that. We really appreciate it. And finally, before networking, if you need to leave us now, again, I know life is happening in the background. I want to thank you for attending and remind you to register for the SOLAS special. There's always something good happening at the Welcoming Center. And the SOLAS special will be with, as Anuj mentioned, Bill Stock and Anuj Gupta on March 24th from 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find the link to register in the chat. Bueno, so this is how networking will go. If you're able to stay with us, we cannot wait for you to participate. There will be small breakout groups created for everyone participating in the networking session. Please stay on Zoom if you would like to join us. Groups will then rotate to give everyone a chance to see some new faces and get to know the Welcoming Center community. Each small group will have one facilitator who's either a board member, a staff member, or a program participant. That's the most exciting part. If you have any questions or are having trouble navigating, please reach out to Alex at thewelcomingcenter.org or to SOLAS 2021 event staff in the chat. As we move into our networking session, I really, I honestly cannot say it enough. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your warmth, your energy, and your voice, virtual as it may have been tonight. Don't forget to keep up with us on social media at Welcoming Center on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And honestly, we cannot wait to see you next year. Our hope, of course, is that we will be in person 
shoulder to shoulder, smile to smile, and maybe just maybe without masks. Let's hope for it, right? We can all hope. Thank you. And as Giselle reminded us, wherever you came from and however you got here, we are so happy to see you. Have a wonderful night. Buenas noches.